But fortunately, we, our visceral nervous system is very much geared to relate. My visceral nervous system and yours, my insides, are regulated by your faces. Is keyed to uh, calm, also by the way, keyed to learning by our face-to-face -face contact, by our body-to-body -body contact. And, um, and that's a good thing. It's especially a good thing for a body-oriented therapist, as I am, uh, because it helps, us, helps me to understand how it is I'm affecting my clients, not just through the intended interventions, but through my presence, through my touch, because I use touch a lot, um, and what needs, what could be enhanced, especially for those of us who have uh, a lot of trauma history, because one of the things that's dysregulated in, from trauma often is the part of our nervous system that regulates us socially and connects us and relates us. Um, and I'm, what I would like to do is to present some, uh, some work uh, from a neuroscientist named uh, Stephen Porges, neuropsychologist, and how that relates to the concept of support in the way that I understand it in, in Gestalt therapy. And um, it's a very big group, so to do well, to do a little bit of experiential, but in some way that doesn't require too much moving around in chaos. Um, so we'll try some things. So this is an experiment for me to work with this big a group. Um, I've, it seems like a really, really big group. It's, it's certainly over the limit that I put in my workshop of 35. <laughs> I had a dream about this, and I was in my office, and I had this big, kind of unusual and a little bit crazy family that I was seeing in my office. I, not, not to say that's about you, but... <clears throat> <clears throat> and I don't do families, so it's my feeling I don't do this big a crowd. And at the end of the session, I asked the, one of the... I guess it was one of the fathers of the father in the family. So, you know, he had been recommended by someone who had spoken well of me. And I said, so how did I, you know, how, do, how was it? Did I meet up with what you expected? And he said, well, it was, it was okay, but I heard you dressed better. <laughs> So, <clears throat> I work a lot with the concept of support. And uh, if those of you who've read uh, Healing Tasks, which is my book on trauma, know that that's a whole uh, crucial phase in healing uh, aspect of connecting with support. And uh, a lot of how I view the work that I do with the body, hands-on work, is in the context of this notion of support for contact. And we're, we really owe this notion to Laura Pearls. <clears throat> who said, if, if you go too quickly beyond the boundary, you may feel unsupported. Certain supports are necessary and essential. The lack of essential support always results in anxiety. And Gary Yontif, um also expanded on this. Support refers to anything that makes contact or withdrawal possible. Energy, body support, breathing, information, concern for others, language, and so forth. Support mobilizes the resources for contact or withdrawal. I'm seeing how, how this um, system responds to, uh, <laughs> to the PowerPoint I have. So, can't see the screen, I have to look at the uh, monitor. 
So Laura worked. And who, anyone who's worked with Laura Pearls? Anyone raise your hand? Well, you know that she attended exquisitely to breathing. She attended exquisitely to, to posture as it supported contact and different, the different quality of contact that we bring. Um, Laura worked, she had experience with yoga. She worked with Elsa Gindler, um, who some of you may know uh, her name. Um, part of that physical culture movement in Germany before World War II, uh, uh, developer of sensory, uh, Charlotte Selver's work really came out of Elsa Gindler's work. And this tradition of exquisite attention to uh, body posture and orientation and use and movement. And it's interesting that this work about support came from Laura. And I really think of that as different than uh, Fritz's orientation, which was very phallic to me. Uh, this notion of support uh, came about, of course, by someone who actually held and had babies. <clears throat> I'm not sure the way Fritz talks about uh, development in his books, it's not clear that he's ever, he ever actually held a baby or fed one. <laughs> so I just want to give a, uh, the importance of having this voice in Gestalt therapy from its inception. <coughs> Maybe it's conception. I think this is, by the way, I'm missing some slides, so I'm just going <clears> to... <throat> so, giving you time to, to actually see the image. <clears throat> this first image is by a woman, um, Esther Gokali. Some of you may know about her work. <clears throat> and you can see the way in which carriage and um, this alignment supports <laughs> supports the contact with uh, hands and objects that can be held and um, this is good contact or this is good support for contact. Actually, I think it's good contact. I don't make the same division that support and contact are uh, different things. Their, their support is of the process of contact. And, and then you can see the, this is typical posture now. And this supports a certain kind of contact with a certain kind of medium of contact, because all contact is through some medium. But it also makes difficult contact that's beyond the screen distance. And it also makes difficult contact that involves the heart or the front of the body, um, or support that needs backbone, needs the posterior line of the body. Um, and so these are all things that um, we and our trainees especially need to be attending to because the millennial generation is, and, and now younger, uh, is really oriented towards these kinds of modes of, of either contact or, or a very diminished kind of uh, contact uh, and very uh, limited tolerance for interpersonal contact. What, what kind of embodiment is needed to support contact that's not screen to screen, that's not text based this way? We could have long discussions on this, but we won't. So the notion of embodied support for contact, uh, physical posture and orientation. Um, a lot of my work is with the way in which body sensation, I, do, I work a lot with our experienced felt sensation in very, um, sometimes very detailed ways. And one of the things that's really important is that we modulate the amount of body sensation we have available 
by the diminishment of our breathing, by the regulation of our breathing. The less breathing we have available, the less body sensation we have available. So part of the dilemma that we have um, of accessing feelings, whoops, for clients, <coughs> is that we, when we downregulate our breathing, we don't have access to much other than our thinking. It's not a problem of thinking, it's a problem of access and having enough uh, intensity of sensation. <clears throat> this is a built-in mechanism. I, I'm gonna get off a little bit on this because it's important to me. It's a built-in mechanism, you know, if you're surprised and you go, <gasps> that's built into the human organism. It's a way of stopping breathing so that we can concentrate on danger, auditory, visual, exterior. So if you ask someone to concentrate on what they're sensing in their body, they will go, I, I don't feel much. Because the same mechanism that we used to heighten the signal to noise for external, quiet the noise of heartbeat and quiet the noise of our insides so we can hear the outsides better, doesn't help us to hear and sense the insides. So we need to work, we need to maintain breathing to support sensation. So I put it into support. Uh, so that we can work with that. So people begin to see how they regulate and work with their breathing for intensity of sensation. And the other support, uh, which we haven't really, wasn't really developed in Gestalt therapy because the neuroscience was so primitive at the, the time, uh, is the way in which we modulate our own and others' arousal levels to support different kinds of contact. So this, this some of this, this is, will be repetitive to this audience, but in modern, the, the, one of the, some of the differences in modern Gestalt therapy from classical. Uh, Gordon Wheeler um, was really, uh, I think, an important influence on talking about contact as a modulating and modulated process rather than a binary one. In the old days in Gestalt, uh, when I was trained, people were talking about being in contact and not in contact. And Gordon's uh, pointed out, and this, that's something I find very important, is that contact is not, not in contact. It's modulated across a a lot of continuums. Things, the resistances like um, projection and retroflexion and desensitization are ways we grade and modulate our contact, not avoid it. Although very, 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 very modulated contact can certainly seem like no contact at all. But enough about our relationships. <coughs> Sorry, that's a joke that didn't work. <laughs> Usually I say, but you've been in that relationship anyway. And we also think of contact as not as an individual within me, but as a relational between process. And as it turns out, the, the um, the embodied processes or the aspects of relational contact are um, a lot more neurobiologically complex than the oral dentition model had any notion of. And these processes are fitted to the, to the neurobiological substrata, meaning our equipment that are built in us to support relational contact. Part of our 
biological equipment. I don't know if this, this does this make sense so far? Does it translate? Okay, good, thanks. By the way, I just want to check my time and know where we are in that. Maybe. <laughs> There's a clock here somewhere, but I see that this clock I can't read without my glasses. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna, this, some of this may be familiar already to you. It's a big audience, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I guess gonna entertain myself enough to speak. So our, the classical view of the autonomic nervous system, you know the autonomic, the nervous system that runs our insides, our blood uh, flow, our um, digestion, our breathing, and our heart rate, our heartbeat. <clears throat> so the classical view of this that was known more or less beginnings of gestalt therapy is that the autonomic nervous system is purely functional. In fact, it's important because in Pearl's Hefferlein and Goodman, for example, anything that's now inside, like we take something in, it's now given over to unconscious, unawares processes. And the, our visceral being was not part of the model in early Gestalt therapy. Contact was defined as kind of in this boundary between and not inclusive of our kind of insights because that's all just automatic process. Digestion. So we, we don't really have a model that includes digestion. We have a model that includes chewing. Still, still in this zone of somehow meeting, grappling with, but not once it's swallowed, except as it sits badly in us, as introject, right? <clears throat> and that's a problem of not chewing, or that's how it was viewed. Um, but it turns out that our insides is, are very, very important for relational contact. Not, and not just automatic in that way. So the classical view was we have the sympathetic nervous system, which is not sympathetic, by the way. <laughs> At all. Our sympathetic nervous system ramps us up, energy up, energy expending, um, arousal, and in emergency, fight or flight. So heart rate up, breathing up, energy to muscles, ready for expenditure, output. And our parasympathetic nervous system, the other side of it, is all about ramping down, energy conserving, digesting, Mm, quieting, you can feel the shift even in as I voice it, so it's down. By the way, we th it's down because our di digestion is down. The parasympathetic vagus nerve and so on goes mostly in the same direction as our food does, down. Up and out, sympathetic. Down. So we come down. We don't come up. We get fired up. We downshift. So, by the way, these directions, just at the most basic level, these directions are really important. Because we also feel into ourselves. By the way, we let down often into sadness. Sometimes sadness comes up and over, overwhelms us. 
but we let down in the sense of we drop into our insides, particularly our mm, respiration or lungs.